Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans and you're watching the John Cedars channel from the bunker and I am immensely honoured to have today's guest on the channel. It's a lady I've been a huge admirer of over many years in fact, who has a remarkable story about missionary work as a Jehovah's Witness in China, which has now been released as a book, uh, leaving the witness I'm delighted to welcome to the channel, Amber Scora. Hello, Amber. Thank you so much, Lloyd. I'm so honored to be here as well. What's it like to be a published author? <laughs> well, it's exciting. I mean, it's a little nerve wracking. Um, you know, given the two audiences for this book, one of which being all the regular people in the world, um, including us, um, and then all the people from the past. So when I wrote the book, I definitely was not, I had to not think about people reading it. Um, but you know, the closer you get to it coming out into the world, you realize that there will be some repercussions probably, but uh, it feels exciting though. I'm happy to have the story and it's actually exciting to see how much people, even people who aren't extra Jehovah's witnesses are really interested in the religion and in the story. And so that's been really encouraging and exciting. Well, it, it's interesting, I would imagine, for many outsiders full stop to know a little bit more about what goes on in the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses. But it's also fascinating, you could say, from an ex-Jehovah's Witness perspective, people who are more informed about the religion, to see how the work gets done in this part of the world that's so mysterious and where the work is in fact under ban to, to get yeah. that perspective. So regardless of the audience, there's a lot there in this book, I feel, that will keep people interested. Yeah, and it um, goes back in time also, flashes back to sort of like my upbringing and how I became a witness and the story of that and uh, yeah, a lot of the people, I've done a few interviews for the book already and almost every person that interviews me always says, it's strange, but there's just not that much out there about Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't really know any stories of people who left. They're just not really come out to the mainstream yet. And a lot of them ask me why that, why that is. Given that, you know, other religions, there's a lot of information from ex-members out there. Indeed. Well, it, it's, it's a fascinating story, but it's also beautifully told. Um, we were just talking off air and I was mentioning how, you know, the way you've written it, you really do feel transported to Shanghai, for example, and you're, you're kind of feeling the sights and sounds along with you. Um, it's just a, a, a beautifully written book and um, so privileged to have you on the channel. Um, <laughs> perhaps we should, as you say, go back in time and just give viewers a sense of how you first got involved with Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, um, well, my story is funny because I was not, my parents were, I'm third generation Jehovah's Witness, but my parents, when I was a young, like a baby, became inactive. So I didn't have a lot, the, like the typical witness early childhood in that I wasn't at the meetings every week but I did have grandparents who were all witnesses and they lived in the same city as me. So as I got older, my grandmother would take us to the meeting, us kids to the meetings, even though my parents didn't go. And I went to the conventions and the memorial. And I think what that served to accomplish is that it just, I don't know if I was a neurotic child or if it made me a neurotic child, but I think when you're a child who doesn't have full access to the community and you just show up at these meetings and you, you know, I was a pretty, I don't know, like intense kid in that I listened to what was said. And when I heard things like that, we were all going to die at Armageddon if we didn't go to the meetings, it really scared me. And I used to have a lot of nightmares um, to the point where after a few years of sort of these sporadic meeting attendance, I went to my father and asked him if we could go back to the meetings. And I was just a kid of like probably seven or eight years old, but I was terrified that we were all going to die. Um, and the funny part is, is that the reason my whole family came back as active witness, as active witnesses, is because of me. <laughs> wow, as a seven or eight year old, who <laughs> was terrified of Armageddon. Yeah, yeah like I so narrowly escaped. But you know, it's like part of part of writing this book. I think, like you know, I've I left the witnesses like 10, 10 years ago now, and I think at first it took me some time to really feel 
the kind of outrage that I've come to at this point after writing the book, I think, I, you know, I, I, I come, at first I didn't really think it was a cult, you know, at first when I left, I was like, oh, I think some things are true. I think a lot of us go through that process where at first we're like, I know some of this stuff is wrong, but maybe some of it's still right. And then I slowly started to read other books like about the actual Bible itself and the origins and the translation. And then I started to think like, okay, wait a minute, like sort of a slow process of deprogramming to the point where I think I got to like a neutral point. I wrote an article in The Believer and I think that was in like 2013. I feel like I wasn't, I was still at like a kind of neutral point when I wrote that article where I wasn't solely like thinking of it as some sort of cult. I okay. love that article, by the way. I was transfixed by it. I, I, I've been hooked on your story ever since 2013 and reading that article, by the way. Uh, but yeah, uh, so you were still relatively, you know, yeah, like going had, through your deprogramming stage when you yeah. were, yeah. I think like, and I, I think I still would hear like thunder and be like, maybe I was wrong. <laughs> it's Armageddon. <laughs> but then through the process of writing this book over the next few years, I started to do a lot of research and reading about mind control and reading about how, you know, different groups, maybe not only Jehovah's Witnesses, but use this kinds of like um, thought reform, you know, to get people to stay in. And then by the t I think by the time I finished writing it, I was fully convinced that like <laughs> something had to be done to sort of at least make more awareness, like things that you are doing. Um, because I started to, I think, process just how damaging the religion is to people in their lives. And then the other thing that I started to look at was how doctrinally, I've been doing some research for some papers, I'm going to college now, and so I was taking some religion classes and I was doing some research on like the two witness rule or like the um, blood transfusion issue. And then when you start even using the Bible itself to do what they say they're doing, which is interpret itself, you come to see that like, a lot of these doctrines are just, they're dumb. Mm. Like I hate to say it, but it's, they don't add up. Even if you use the Bible, it's just like people opening up like one scripture and being like 50 years ago, I'm going to make this doctrine and now we have to stick to it. Mm. So that kind of stuff was stuff that's happened to me. I think this, there's just like this journey, the more years you've been out, your path, like the path you take and the way that you start to think and process things changes. So yeah, it was interesting writing the book because I think it kind of got me to the next level where I, I felt like I had, my, my mindset had shifted a little and I felt like, like we, people need to get out of this religion. <laughs> Indeed. No, I, I think a lot of people can relate to that. There's the initial kind of relief almost of, of having your life back. And then the more you take in information and you hear other people's stories. I mean, when you released your Believer article, that was still fairly early in my waking up process. I'd already started getting involved in activism by that point, but I was still putting the pieces together. And yeah. only kind of when you do that and you kind of enter into that kind of deprogramming phase that you realize just how much your life has been hijacked and yeah. just how uh, much damage is being done in other people's lives, even though you may have escaped relatively unscathed. So. It's true. And I even think like it's with the perspective of 10 years out, I, I can see more the repercussions of having lost like the first 30 years of my life to that. Uh, and that's something that's, you know, it was a little painful processing through the book too, because it does take a lot to try and like catch up or, you know, get to a point where you, you feel like you would have been had you not been in the religion. Mm. But yeah, again, one of the most fascinating elements for me, uh, not just with your book, but also when I first heard about your story was the fact that you were in China because Jehovah's Witnesses, I think, still think of China as the frontier, that the place yeah. where, you know, the real kind of pioneering work is done because everything must be done undercover. You're not supposed to be there. You could be at best deported if you're discovered uh, preaching there. So the, the fact that you are kind of lifting the lid on this very kind of unknown element of witness life, even to witnesses, yeah. um, is fascinating. So without wanting to spoil too much from the book, what is it like being a Jehovah's Witness in China? I mean, honestly, when I got there within the first couple months, 
I had no intention of leaving the religion. I was still a true, full believer, but I definitely thought to myself more than once, I'm never going home again <laughs> because it was so much easier than being a witness at home, which is funny. You wouldn't necessarily think that way, but it was definitely the most freedom I'd ever had in my life. Um, and that freedom was because of the nature of the fact that obviously our work is done underground there. So what happens is that you only, rather than having like multiple meetings a week, service arrangements to get to multiple times a week, congregation activities and association, um, basically everything is just boiled down into one meeting a week. And so uh, on Sundays, they'd have like a three hour meeting and they would just cram sort of like an abridged version of the meeting into that three hour period. And for me, it was great. I don't know, some people I know that were Jehovah's Witnesses loved the aspect of the community and the meetings and the congregation, but for some reason, I was just never really into that. <laughs> I found the meetings kind of boring, but you know, you had to do it. So in China, it was sort of like, I feel like that one meeting, everything compressed into that amount of time was like, that was about like a good pace for me. Like you could just like get through it. I don't think we read the paragraphs in the magazine. There wasn't always a public talk. Um, things were condensed. So what that meant though, was that if you think about how much of your time as a regular witness is spent, you know, daily with witness activities, um, suddenly when everything is just one day a week and then the rest of the time is your time to do what you will with it. And obviously a lot of that time I spent preaching, um, it does give you even just having those vast swaths of time to fill without like indoctrination coming at you or, you know, so like validation of having other witnesses around you like you do at home um definitely opened up the door for just having some free freedom and i think like when you're in a highly controlled religious group like the jehovah's witnesses you know, any kind of mental space or even like free time is kind of a dangerous thing i think that's why these cults keep people so busy so yeah i would say if you know any jehovah's witnesses listening it's a great, it's a great life made in China. Um, you you mentioned that the one meeting per week. Um, am I right in saying that these meetings were for, for you could say Westerners only? Yeah. Or, yeah. or, or basically Europeans or Americans or Canadians yeah. only. Um, and were these meetings also in English? Yeah, they were. And I don't know how it is now. I'm, I don't know if things have changed. Uh, but back then, they kept the foreigners separate from the Chinese, at least in these big cities, just because it would obviously draw too much attention if there were Chinese people and Western people coming to this, you know, meeting place and mingling together. It, it would be a little obvious. And it would also, the other, the other factor was that if a Westerner got caught, the worst punishment would probably be deportation, maybe a night in jail, I don't know, maybe some questioning. But if you were a local and you got caught, it's obviously much more severe in China. Um, so I think that, you know, that was a matter that was sort of a safety precaution. And then if you had studies and eventually they were progressing and they were Chinese, they would be handed over to the Chinese side. So that's what I'm interested in. So your, your preaching work and that's another fascinating thing about your story and, and what I've enjoyed about the book is just how in a way devious it is because yeah. your, your preaching um, is basically making friends with people f with an ulterior motive. W yeah. When you do preaching uh, in the West, you're very upfront about what the purpose of the conversation is almost from the very first conversation. Yeah. But in... Um, in China, what you're doing is you're, you're befriending people with the aim of eventually, when you feel it's safe, sneaking in the Bible. Yeah. Um, Which, as that, I point out in the book, is like a clumsy proposition at the best of times. But in China, it's even more awkward. <laughs> like, by the way, I was just thinking about, have you ever heard of this thing called the Bible? It's, yeah, it's a little awkward. <laughs> but were you, were you frightened of the kind of cards on the table moment where your study does progress to the point where you can be fully upfront about your beliefs and then the you're kind of unmasked as this fraud who's been befriending them for an ulterior motive were you frightened of reaching that point in the friendship you know it's like a it's like a fine it's like you're walking a little bit of a tightrope because 
I don't think that you ever would reveal to the person that that was your ulterior motive from the start. And as you say, thinking back now, it does seem like it was very deceptive and kind of wrong to sort of start these friendships with, you know, this false premise. Um, but yeah, you know, witnesses were caught, what is it again? Cautious as serpents, innocent as doves. Like that's how you would, the whole through line was that. So there was never a point where like, you just came out with it and you're like, so I just wanted to let you know that whole thing where I was trying to make your friend, it was only so I could convert you. It never really came to that. Um, also, I can't say that I ever had a Bible study progress that far. Um, so I wouldn't know. However, I do, you know, in the book, there's the character Jean, whose name has been changed to protect her identity. Well, she never became a witness. And one of the great joys I have is that um, she just received a copy of my book this morning. And oh, wonderful. And told me she can't wait to read it. Oh, that, so, I, I love the fact that you're still in touch with her. That's brilliant. I know, we're really good friends now, yeah. So um, at the end of the day, you know, at the, at the time, it was a very, very strange situation because she didn't really understand all of what was going on when I left religion and sort of like told her I couldn't study with her anymore. Um, but at, all, all in all, it's come for a full circle. And um, in the end, Jean and I are the ones that are friends. <laughs> Fantastic. And genuine friends. And hopefully she's forgiven you for the deceit early on yeah, in your relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but what what's the end game? I mean, presumably, even though you were unsuccessful, I mean, did you even, were you even aware of other Westerners out there managing to advance a Bible student to the point where they got baptized? Did that ever happen to your knowledge? I think that did happen, happen, sorry. Um, I think that there, once the, once the study was handed over to the Chinese side though, there was no contact anymore with the Westerner. I think it was sort of really like things were kept very separate. So I'm sure there's people, I mean, I do have two Bible students who did get baptized, but they were both from Taiwan. I would say like the conversion rate though is very low in China, I would guess based on my own experience, because it's just, you know, as I talk about in the book, it's, the whole premise, like the whole premise that we're starting from is just sounds like very alien mm. Chinese culture. And, and the other thing is that, you know, looking back now, it seems the effrontery of, you know, us with our 100 year old religion or whatever, however old it is coming and telling this culture of, you know, thousands of years of like wisdom and Confucius and like cultural development, you know, sort of like coming along with our 100 year old ideas. We know better. Like, yeah. This is better. <laughs> you know, it's a little, I can, I can see now it's, it's a little, it'd be a little hard to accept. <laughs> sure. And I think that the, the clash of cultures featured heavily to some degree in, in your awakening. So I want to come to that, but I'm also, again, just fascinated by, these kind of Westerners who um, who go to China and again practice this deceit and meet yeah. in a hotel conference suite by the sounds of things on yeah. a weekly basis to have parties yeah. um, that are really just condensed meetings. Yeah. I actually I knew I had a friend who went to China and he was actually when I first moved out to Croatia and I had a business here in Croatia he was actually my accountant and I reached an awkward point. That's right. He told me at one point that I had to be very careful when I was emailing him not to mention stuff right. to do with JWs. He kind yeah. of made that clear from the beginning. But there were, there were also reached this point where I realized that I was going to be leaving. So I actually gave him the option of quitting as my accountant because I was going to be leaving the religion. And he took that opportunity to leave. So I had to find a new accountant. So I, I, know, I know that there are obviously in my own experience, Westerners who go out there, you mentioned a little bit about how the kind of quirkiness that's required yeah. for, for someone to kind of make that decision. How would you describe, it's hard to generalize, I realize, but yeah. what are the kind of, what's the kind of Jehovah's Witness that um, embraces this life? I would say the, the quirkiness is not unique to Jehovah's Witnesses going to China. A lot of China attracts a lot of foreigners who go as English teachers, sometimes people that don't fit in so well at home. Hmm. In Shanghai, um, it was a mixture. I would say there were 
a number of people there who were there for work, like European, a couple of like German or Austrian um, people who had been sent who actually had jobs that forced them to relocate to China, some from South America as well. So there was that factor. And then there were people, I think there were a lot of people that were kind of like my ex-husband and I, um, pioneers who didn't have kids. And I think there's some like sense of wanting adventure or doing something different than just going around your neighborhood, pioneering for years and knocking on doors. So there was those type of people. But um, yeah, I think it also attracted people who were very intense. It's hard for me to really like say, pinpoint what something strange about people were was, but you know, anyone who can like leave their home and go to this foreign place and learn a language, they probably like got some sort of like, they're not the uniform witness. And so I mm. guess people who would be willing to go might be people who I, I found beyond the quirkiness, as I mentioned, when I had that elders meeting, when I was sort of charged with apostasy, I also found that there were people who witnesses who seemed a little more liberal than people at home. That was another difference in the sense that like, you kind of got this chance to still be a witness, but not be under the same kind of control as you were at home. So there was that too. Um, I don't know, the character I describe in my book, the one who introduced us to how the preaching work is done and kind of filled us in on these things. Um, I don't know how I can define his quirkiness. I mean, the- This was Anthony, was it? The Yeah, Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> um, just like, you know, odd people. I mean, I like odd people. So maybe that's why I fit in there too. I'm not saying I wasn't one of the weird ones. I'm sure I was. <laughs> I just find it a fascinating kind of sub demographic of, of Jehovah's Witnesses. I, I almost wish I could sample and speak to some, you know, yeah. perhaps undercover just to find out what makes them tick. But again, reading your book is a, is a brilliant way of doing that. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned about the culture. And I think, again, it's safe to say that the culture factored into your kind of distancing yourself from your beliefs. So talk us through uh, that process that you went through. Um, yeah, I talk about this in the book a lot. It's, um, I think like, you know, here you are, you're a pioneer for many years. I had already been in Taiwan for three years and I was getting to a point where I could speak Mandarin, you know, enough to do what I needed to do after three years in Taiwan. Um, I think there was like, a, maybe there's like a certain amount of hubris that you have as you like get into China, you kind of feel like, oh, I was like chosen to go here. Um, you know, I feel, you feel kind of sort of special. And uh, also I think even as witnesses, we all had, a, we have sort of a lot of blind spots that can, that led us to believe that we were sort of superior, even though we wouldn't have admitted that to ourselves. So I think, you know, you go into China feeling this way and you kind of feel like you have this legacy of all these missionaries that have come before you and that you've read about in the yearbooks and you kind of feel like you're blazing this trail. Um, and being in China was a really humbling experience. In Taiwan, the brothers and sisters, I mean, they're wonderful. They were so supportive and like they helped us to get set up and, you know, it was like a very like wonderful culture. Taiwanese people are wonderful people, both witnesses and non-witnesses, very nice people. Um, but yeah, getting to China was kind of shocking because it, China is like, a, can be a very intense place. So without this sort of buffer of like in Taiwan, a lot of people have lived overseas before, they're used to Westerners and, you know, they, they like Westerners. In China, you definitely didn't feel as welcome. So there was kind of that, that, you know, suddenly I didn't feel as much like, you know, this like Jehovah's Witness rock star. It was sort of, I had to like, it was hardcore trying to like make our way there. Um, but culturally, interestingly, what I started to notice uh, as a Westerner is that almost, almost everything that came naturally to me as, you know, as far as just even practical things, like, I mentioned in the book, like even say like the way that you address an envelope, like everything was opposite. We start at the name, they start at the country. Um, almost anything that you tried to accomplish, you somehow couldn't accomplish. Um, and even this is speaking the language. Uh, so there's these things, there's like cultural things that say, for example, like on a hot day, they drink hot water. Like they won't let you drink cold water. Like all these things just start to kind of add up and pile up. And I think that 
that's why travel is good, whether it's as a witness or even just for a regular person in the sense that you start to see that there's other ways of being in the world. And that can kind of get you to see yourself better. I think you have a lot of blind spots when you're a person who's just grown up in one country or one congregation or city uh, and you sort of think that you understand everything and then you get thrown into this environment where everything is done the opposite of what you're accustomed to. So I think that that was part of the beginnings of what started to cause a little bit of self-doubt in me and that um, my mind was just sort of getting turned upside down. I was disoriented in a, in a mild way. Also the language, I think that's another big thing. I had spent three years in Taiwan listening to Chinese meetings and only Chinese meetings. And I learned from that a lot of Chinese. But if you're gonna tell me that that doesn't open up some space in your mind, part of indoctrination is someone coming at you with it on this propaganda, like a regular basis. I definitely think like being in the foreign language probably helped too to create a little space for me. Mm. So anyway, being in China, I think like, Literally, you're, the way that the language works, it's not like when an English person learns Spanish where you can just translate. You have to excavate your mind and think in a different way. And I think it almost opens up like different neural pathways. It made me more open-minded, I think, all of these factors. Not to the point where I would have left my religion, but definitely I, I, I remember starting to have thoughts there as I was studying with people that I had never really had thoughts about before. Just kind of like sort of reading through the paragraphs and sometimes I feel like this sounds crazy. <laughs> it sounds like it was it was kind of teaching you that that there are different ways of living. And if there can be different ways of living, maybe there can be different ways of thinking as well, you know? So and, and one thing that I find fascinating as well about your story is you you, you describe about how when you are introducing the I'm not going to call it that word. When you were introducing the Jehovah's Witness message to people, um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a degree of deception in that you're you're giving them the kind of sugar-coated version um, and only introducing the real message, you know, as the conversation progresses. But in Chinese culture, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's far more you have to say it like it is and get to the point quickly. Would that be fair? Well, the, definitely, I find that the Chinese language is very direct. Right. Definitely, that is true. And I think that that does affect the way maybe even now that I understand Chinese, maybe it sounded more, you're hearing it with new ears when you're hearing it in a new language. So I can, I can definitely say that could be a factor too, yes. The weird thing about studying with people there was that they, unlike anywhere else in the world, they didn't know the difference between Jehovah's Witnesses and other Christians too. So that was something kind of in our favor because a lot of, especially young Chinese people, because Christianity is so forbidden in most, most forms of Christianity are quite forbidden in China. Christianity is something subversive and kind of cool. So, you know, if, if somebody wants to kind of rebel against their parents in the West, it's not by going to church. It's in, it, but in China, it's, if you go to church, it's kind of a rebellious act. Um, so that was also kind of, a weird way of preaching too because as you say here right away we'd have to start like owning all the weird jehovah's witness stuff but they you know they didn't know and the the difference they just thought that they were learning about jesus and that was cool indeed can you speak can you still speak chinese yeah i can i mean i definitely think i've probably lost some after all these years but I still go for Chinese massages in Chinatown and chat with the... <laughs> well, in, in that case, since we are promoting your book, yeah. uh, maybe you could say something about your book in Chinese. <laughs> I got to think about how I would translate. I hate to put you on the spot, but hey, you know. Uh, <laughs> Fantastic. It's basically it was like before I was in China I was preaching about the Bible, uh, and now I'm using I've I've written a different kind of book. <laughs> Wonderful. No, I, I love the sound. It, it's a very tonal language, isn't it? And yeah. I did actually um 
I, I kind of flirted with learning foreign languages when I was pioneering in the UK. And I remember going to maybe one or two, um, I think it was actually not Mandarin, but Cantonese mm. um, classes that I went to. And it, it just, it was like learning Klingon for me. It was just so difficult. I, I couldn't do it, but exactly. it sounds like you've mastered it there. It sounds very the nice. The only way to learn Chinese is you got to be in the environment. Cause yeah. Yeah, like there's no, I remember my first Mandarin meetings in Vancouver when I was first learning, you can't even pick out one word. It's just like a wall of words, but there is one word in Chinese, gay, which is give, which would come up a lot in the meetings. And then there was another word, woman, like woman, it looks like women, but that means uh, us. So I was, the only word I could hear in the whole meeting was gay woman. I was like, gay women? <laughs> that was it. Sounds, yeah. sounds rather Freudian, that. Uh, Amber, yeah. Don't mind me saying. Uh. But, um, yeah, eventually I learned to love Chinese. And honestly, one of the saddest things for me is that I don't speak Chinese anymore. And it was hard to leave China because I did love China and I loved living there in many ways, although there was many things that are, you know, really intense about living in China. But the biggest thing I miss is speaking Chinese. So I do try to think like sometimes when I feel like I'm, you know, all of us that leave, I think it's really overwhelming, especially when we didn't leave when we were 18. So we didn't go to college or get fine careers. I think, I don't know if you found this, but I've just found it, it feels hard to catch up to where I feel like I would have been if I had not been trapped in this religion. But there, there are ways to think about this. And I think one of these things is I think, well, the reality is if I hadn't been a Jehovah's Witness and had such a drive to save people, I would have never devoted the energy I did to learning that language and to understanding another culture. So I think like, you know, for all the bad things that being a witness feels like it has manifested in our lives, there are sometimes these things that are just so weird and unique and did become experiences that formed us and even maybe got us out of the religion. So if there's anything to take away from it, I try to sometimes think of that in a positive way because mm. it is cool to be able to speak Mandarin. I enjoy it. Well, our experiences make us who we are for good yeah. or for bad. And your experience is extremely unique to the point where it's enabled you to write this amazing book, which I'm sure will help many people. So if, if you'd not been through that whole experience, this book wouldn't exist and those was. people wouldn't <laughs> be helped in perhaps the way they will be helped. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to... I want you to kind of explain to some extent, again, without spoiling too much, uh, what, led, what led to you leaving China and, and leaving the witnesses? How, how did that process come together? Like, do you mean why did I decide to leave China so you, even after I left? You're kind of or? this optimistic <laughs> um, need greater, you could say, who's moved yeah. to China. And you, you believe, you, you mentioned that when you were first arrived, you, you were very serious about the religion. So what changed? How did it change? And how did the yeah. local witnesses react to it changing? Oh, yeah, that was, well, it's definitely a slow process. And I think a lot of people, I don't know how your audience, other Jehovah's Witnesses, how it happened for them, but a lot of people who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses who talk to me about the experience, they always think that there's something like a movie where you have this dramatic epiphany one day you just like wake up and you realize it's I'm in a false religion um, but for me I don't know about for you but it wasn't like that I think for a lot of us it's like a slow process it's like a lot of factors had to come together for one thing if I hadn't been in China I would definitely be a Jehovah's Witness right now there's no way I would have left I, I was not the doubting Thomas kind I I believed it so fully um, I was really like totally bought in, but it took a bunch of factors to sort of loosen my grip. So first of all, like many witnesses, I was in a marriage very young and you know, when you get married so young, it's, you're often not with a person who's really compatible with you. So I had been married by the time I went to China with my ex, now ex-husband, I had been married, I think like seven or eight years by that point. Um, and uh, so there was that factor. My, I, I knew that we weren't really right together and he's a nice person, but I didn't think we should be married. Of course, I couldn't do anything about that. So that was kind of running in the background. You know, I thought we both thought like whatever, Armageddon is going to come and then everything will be perfect. So you just stay together because you have to. So that was kind of like, I think, a current in the background. And then um, I ended up, at first I was an English teacher, which is what many witnesses do. Again, the deceit. 
my um, ex-husband got this sort of like fake degree, one of those online degrees that you can get for, I don't know, I think it was $3,000. I've heard about these. So these aren't like genuine transferable degrees. They're just yeah. kind of, they just it's allow like, you to pass as an English instructor, do they? Honestly, in that era, when they first started, I remember some other guy who wasn't a witness I think he got like a degree from Oxford for $200 online. I don't oh, know, like, good grief. In China, there's so much falification of stuff that it is one place you can get away with, with this. So with this justified the means, I, I assume. Yeah, so definitely a lot of witnesses jumped on that bandwagon because if you were going to teach in a school and get a proper work visa, you had to have a degree. So um, my ex-husband did that I helped like we each did it but he got the degree because we couldn't afford to and then uh, he got the work permit and then I just taught English tutoring and the way that you teach English in China is most people can they know everything about English but you just they need someone to practice conversation with so I was teaching English for a while and that gave me a lot of insight into Chinese culture just learning about people who were not witnesses because most of the people I knew in Taiwan were witnesses um, and then after a while I, I I had heard, I had started listening to these Chinese language learning podcasts that had just started. This was like the first wave of podcasting and uh, I loved them. And I, ever since I was a kid, I've always loved pretending I was like a radio host. It's weird, but I wrote this company because I was like, I want to work there. I've always been a person who it's weird. You know, you're a witness and you're not allowed to be ambitious. I think my outlet for being sort of like driven and excited to do things in the world was going to China. Cause that was like the most farthest thing maybe I could do as a woman who was in the organization, but still I couldn't help myself when I was in China. I was like, Oh, that, that would be so fun to do that kind of work. So I ended up getting a job there. And that was definitely the beginning of the downfall because I started to make creative work and, I ended up creating this podcast that got very big, very fast. And it, it had a lot of listeners like all over the world. And so I just started to interact more with people. And because in China, you know, in, in workplaces in, at home, we always would tell people we're witnesses and it would create a separation, which you always need in order to keep on being a witness, the us versus them. But in China, I couldn't tell them I was a witness. So I, there was less separation. And then uh, ultimately what happened was um, after a year or two, one of the podcast listeners started to write me. I started to like write him back and we kind of developed, it wasn't an intimate relationship. We had never met, but it was a relationship where somehow we just started talking all the time. And this man who lived in Los Angeles started to, he found, I, I revealed eventually that I was a witness through some code because we couldn't write that overtly online. And he basically, when he found out, he made it his mission to deep, try to like prove to me that, that I, I was in a cult basically. So you can read that whole, <laughs> the, sure. how that ended is wow. in the book. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll leave that cliffhanger right there. Um, <laughs> Factor, yeah. But wow, yeah, it's just amazing. And and what an unlikely kind of chain of events, which again, I think just goes to show that, um, you know, you, you, you had this kind of path that there's a lot of individuality in the decisions that you made. And you can see that your creativity was trying to shine through yeah, despite the kind of confines that you were in. And it's resulted in this beautiful story that again, I'm sure will help many people. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's such a strange thing. Like, uh, I definitely think that all of us, yeah, you can, for a person like me anyway, I definitely think for me, it had to come through the back door. Um, and interestingly, I was reading this book by Alexandra Stein. Do you know? Have you yes. Heard of her? One of the, I've met her, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. She's also British, right? Sure, yeah. Um, I was reading the book Love, Terror, and Brainwashing. And this was so it's such a revelation to me because... I think all of us, you know, it's different things that get people into the witnesses and also different things get people out. And for me, I definitely had to not see it coming. Like if, if, if it had come, you know, like I, I, I wouldn't have just gone on the internet and watched John Cedar's channel. Like I, I would, I was too good. Like I was too like devout for that. But what had to happen for me was that it had to come through the back door. And one thing that Alexandra Stein, is it Alexandria or Alexandra? Alexandra, I think, yeah. Alexandra. She mentions that one of the only ways for people to deprogram from cult indoctrination is if 
they have an intimate relationship with someone on the outside who is not a member of that cult because basically that's the only person that you will let your guard down with enough to hear what they're saying. And this is why when we try to go back to our families and be like, it's a cult, read this crisis of conscience book. Like I sent my sister and she threw it in the trash. <laughs> it's like, you know, it has to come through this sort of channel with someone who's on the outside who you trust. And that's kind of what happened with me where I started to just trust this person and think about what they said and never thought that I was gonna, you know, leave my religion. But slowly it infiltrated because I had sort of allowed myself to become close enough to someone who wasn't a witness to actually give them a chance to tell, to tell me something. I think that's like a really interesting thing that happens as well. Sure. You know, all these times where people told you, like I think back, I'm like, of course I should have seen it, but you couldn't hear it. It takes a certain sequence of events and the right kind of person to kind of make you see at least for me that's how it was and, and again the events were very much shaped by the the very unique situation you were in yeah. which which afforded you far more freedom you could say than you would have had if you'd have um yeah. stayed in in canada um you you've mentioned you mentioned briefly that you've you're actually is it university you're at now yeah. um I think it's really admirable that you're in many ways kind of taking those opportunities that were denied to you when you were younger. Um, talk us through that process and, and what it's been like kind of, again, uh, getting in touch with your own individuality post leaving Jehovah's Witnesses. What, what's that journey been like for you? It's been really interesting and it, it's been a multi-year journey because I've been trying to support myself and have children in between. And I think I've been doing it for like seven years <laughs> part-time. Um, but fascinating for me was because I was always a good student and I really liked school. All, at the time of graduation, you know, all my teachers were just like horrified that I wasn't going to university back then. Um, so it did kind of always, I guess, bother me because I liked learning, I liked reading. Um, that I hadn't gone to school. So when I first got to New York, I was kind of overwhelmed. I, it was crazy to just move here. <laughs> but after I got sort of on my feet, after a couple of years, I thought, you know, I gotta just, I wanna just learn more. So I enrolled in university. And it's funny because in the very first class semester, very first class I took, it was a random class. It was like a US history class. And it was in that class that I sat there and thought, I realized that this is why they don't let you go to university. Not just the critical thinking part, but because you just learn things that if I had been 18 and sitting in this class, I would have left the witnesses. And basically the only thing they were talking about was the way that um, they were talking about religious history in the United States and how they're basically the Jehovah's Witnesses among other religions, like the Mormons and the Seventh-day Adventists all formed during this time called the Great Awakening. And the Great Awakening, when these new American religions formed, was only a backlash to, you know, the puritanical society was becoming too secular. And then it would like sw switch back to being more religious society again and fundamentalist. And that like was a sort of war situation going on. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the reason the Jehovah's Witness formed had nothing to do with it being the true or some like revelation. It was just a sociological trend at the time. And I remember sitting in that class being like, that's it. And then also just the lack of uniqueness about it, that there was just like all these other ones that were kind of, some beliefs were the same, some thrived, others died out. And I remember just sitting there thinking like, even this would have got me out because they would have just sort of broken the illusion, the illusions that I had. So that was really interesting. And then ever since then, every single class I've taken um, has just somehow opened up my mind. And I definitely can feel this many years in that it's like I can think better now. It does do something to you in the sense that when we were in it, every thought process was just dulled and sort of like muted and prevented. And then you just can go to school and start, you know, your brain is a, a muscle you can create new synapses and you can learn new things. And all, almost everything has kind of contributed to this, you know, a stronger sense of self, um, but also just an understanding of the world. I can't believe how much I didn't know. I mean, I still don't know 
but there's just so much to learn and so much, the more I learn, the more I just, I can't believe how dumb the Jehovah's Witness doctrine is. It's, it's really sad. <laughs> it's really sad to me how much I believed it and how much so many people believe it. it, it there's like a sadness that comes to you. But yeah, I, I highly recommend if possible for anyone, it, you know, just even if you go slowly, even if it takes you 20 years to finish, it's a really rewarding experience and it gives you your brain back in a way. It just so you would say that it's not too late to get involved oh, in higher education. <laughs> and it's been great. And I think the more I learn, the more connections I make in the outside world and life becomes rich. Yeah. So even if you don't, you know, even if you still don't get an amazing career afterwards, I think it's still worth the process if you can. Sure. I was thinking how my greatest dream is to somehow start a scholarship fund for Jehovah's Witnesses who leave and even maybe just like a counseling service to help people, you know, figure out how to navigate the higher education system because it is such a great joy. And I've also noticed this is that people who weren't Jehovah's Witnesses often go back to school later in life and you can completely change your career, you know, at 40 or 50. So you don't have to feel like you missed the boat. I think it's easy for me to sometimes feel like, oh, it's like I missed the boat. But people do it all the time. You, it just takes a few years and you can embark on something different. So I think it's a really helpful thing in the healing process. Indeed. And I'm glad that you've, that your journey has taken that direction uh, now. And I think it's very inspiring for lots of those who are watching to know that, you know, yeah. it's not the end. You can still, you know, have that journey. Yeah. Yeah. I will say this too. I don't know about other countries, but in the United States also, universities love the story of someone leaving a fundamentalist religion and embarking on a university career. So it's very helpful for scholarships that I just got a full scholarship actually. Wonderful. <laughs> so, you know, if you apply for scholarships and you be honest and just tell your story, it can help with the financial side too. There's a lot of people out there that want to support people like us. That's good to know. That's very good to know. So, um, I'm, I'm almost done. I just, I want to, again, um, thinking about your book, I don't want to uh, spoil too many points, but it, it's clear reading it that you uh, don't have bitterness toward the people that you left behind in the religion. Um, do you, what are your thoughts thinking about people who are still in China now, perhaps even who, who knew you, who you remember, um, I'm interested to know whether you kind of are mindful of, of their kind of fairly precarious situation and whether they'll get found out or in any way persecuted by the authorities as a result of, um, yeah, I thought about that. Yeah. yeah. I thought about that when I was writing the book. And so in the book, all the names were changed, but also details as far as like locations, like where people lived. Um, things have been altered to protect the innocent um, or not so innocent, <laughs> you could say. <laughs> uh, and also, I mean, generally I talk about how we did our work there. I don't, I don't think it's hard for anyone with a bit of an imagination to guess how all these religions operate underground in China. So I was, I did try to be cognizant of that, but ultimately, you know, in writing this book, I mean, I had one last witness friend, my old best friend who still talked to me, and this was definitely like the last, <laughs> sever the last hope in that regard um, to ever sort of have contact. And I, I do really love the people still that I loved before. It makes me sad quite often that they're not in my life. Um, but I don't know if, if you've ever found this, but there were some people who still talked to me because I never got formally disfellowshipped. And I think because all of this went down in China, people sort of were willing to turn a blind eye. And I, I did have a couple of friends who would talk to me. Um, but, you know, the problem is, is that over time I found that those relationships, as much as I miss those people and love them, they're not, it's not really possible to have a relationship on the kind of footing that you would consider a friendship when you're not a witness because everything is conditional. And I remember when I would even hang around some of my old friends, like when I'd go home to Vancouver for a visit, I loved being with them, but because I have muscle memory for the things that are forbidden or the things that I know I can't be, 
you know, I feel like I'm like censoring myself and constantly monitoring myself when I'm around them. Not like I'm that crazy, but like, you know, I'm not, I'm not like wild and crazy here. But it's hard to have a friendship now where there's not this authenticity that you can't really be who you are. So ultimately it's, you know, shunning, sure, shunning is awful, but it's also, you, it, at some point it does feel like because they're so indoctrinated that you're incompatible. It's, it's, I think my defini defin definition of friendship or relationship now is like acceptance and, you know, unconditional love. And if the other person doesn't have that same viewpoint of friendship, it's very hard to have a friendship. It's sad. I, I, I still feel very sad. I'm a very sentimental person and I feel sad about the people I've left behind. And also, I know they're going to be very mad at me <laughs> for writing this book. <laughs> they see it as like a betrayal. They don't understand why I would do it. And I know it's really hard for any witness to understand why we do what we do, right, Lloyd? But Indeed. <laughs> it feels like the right thing to do. Indeed. Oh, well, there's no, there's, it's just useless trying to explain this, isn't it, really? Uh, but ultimately, it's out of love, I think, for witnesses because um, witnesses uh, are, generally speaking, such nice people that they don't deserve to be lied to and exploited. And hopefully by making resources like this available, less will be lied to and exploited. Um, and I think it's working. I mean, I know so many people have said that it's because of your shows and your activism that they've left. And even when I wrote that small article, many people wrote me and there's like a couple in upstate New York who found it, who now left. So I, I hope that, it is my hope that the book too gets into the hands of people that, I think foremost more than anything, it's one thing to have the doubts and whatever. Um, maybe reading my book will help people deprogram to some degree, but I also think what my great hope is that it helps people see that a life outside the religion is possible and like a good life is possible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that when I was leaving, I had no idea. I, I, th I thought it was just, I, I knew I couldn't stand, but what was out there, I felt was just, there was nothing because <laughs> that's what we had been taught. But yeah, my, I'm, in the very closing credits of my book or the acknowledgements, I do write something, um, basically a little note to all my old witness friends and family. If you, if you're, if you've read this far, my door is open. <laughs> like, I feel well, that was going to be my next question. So there are, you, you still have friends and family, even back in Canada, I would assume who are still shunning you. Yeah, they all, they all shun me now. Um, mm -hmm. My brother, luckily, never became a witness, so I have him, but, and I have a cousin who also left the witnesses. But other than that, yeah, they all, they all shun. Sure. There is a paradox as well that, that kind of occurred to me reading your book, um, because obviously I, I've been fairly vocal about what's going on in Russia with the ban in Russia. I, I, I feel that it's... Um, it's not um, advisable for governments to restrict what people are thinking uh, by, by banning religions, as happens both in China and Russia. Yeah. And I think that it, it kind of feeds into the kind of persecution complex narrative that cults like Watchtower rely on to keep yeah. people indoctrinated. But at the same time, um, in your story, it was, in, a, in effect, it was the ban and the different kind of, you could say, local Jehovah's Witness culture that that, created that was instrumental in you having the freedom to to wake up so i'm interested to know how you reconcile those issues and, and whether you think how, how do you feel about um governments regulating religion in that way yeah i definitely agree with you that i don't think persecuting people i think people should have religious freedom i definitely think that people should have the freedom to be whatever religion weird religion they want um, <clears throat> I think that the ban, like what happened to me is a byproduct of just what a ban creates, which is, as I mentioned, a little bit of space, a little bit of pushing things underground, pushing things away from the control of the central organization. So I think I was just lucky in a sense that, that I was in that situation and it led to me waking up rather than led to persecution or something of that nature. Um, so it, it benefited you, but it, it's not necessarily an yeah. advisable model for society to follow. Is that what no, you No, definitely say? not. It just, it's like a byproduct that it does create some space for the witnesses. But I can imagine, it's also a different scenario, I think, in Russia versus China, in the sense that when you're a local person or a local Chinese person, 
um, what the ban and the persecution creates is probably adheres you closer, as you say, to the core of the faith. I think a situation as like an expat or like, you know, person with a luxury of uh, American or British passport going in there and knowing they're not going to get put in jail for the rest of their life. You know, it's definitely like a luxury that not most people under the ban don't have. And mm. so it was That's true. Good. It's like a different scenario yeah. for a, a local Chinese person versus a Westerner who's going in and, and made it their mission to convert based on the fact that they're not going to necessarily spend the rest of their lives in prison if they get caught. So, yeah. Yeah. And it also it kind of leads to this gross, like, say, you know, white savior complex. That was another thing I found to start to really feel creeped out about myself there, where it was like, geez, like, this is just like um, colonialism. Like, it, it's like us coming here, like, we know best, you know? So it's also like, I can't compare myself to anyone that was under ban because um, I didn't face like the kind of risks that people are facing sure. uh, in Russia and China, the locals. Well, Amber, it's been an absolute delight to have you on the channel. I've been wanting yeah. to have you on the channel for quite some time now, and it, it's great to finally have that uh, honor. And I can only encourage everyone watching. This, this video, by the way, will go up on... Let me check the double check the date to make sure I'm absolutely accurate. So uh, June the 4th, 2019 is when this video will be uploaded. So if you're watching this on the date of upload, it is available today on Amazon. A link will be in the, in the description. Go down there, click the link, buy the book. You will not be disappointed. Uh, but Amber, thank you so much for coming on the channel and talking to me. Thanks. I also want to say one thing. For anyone sure. who's a witness watching, you can also get it on Kindle or audiobook if you want to secretly hide the evidence. <laughs> That's a good idea, actually. Yeah, I have mine, my books on Kindle, but only one on audiobook because it was shorter and easier to narrate. But you've gone to the trouble of narrating this as an audiobook as well, which, again, is perfect for surreptitiously um, <laughs> listening to it, perhaps at the convention. <laughs> be indoctrinated by the grotesque videos at this year's convention. Yeah. And also online, I just started a Facebook book club for it. And already there's been some discussion there. And I, I would love for everyone to join it because it's really fun to talk about the issues or if they have questions. It's only extra witnesses so far in there. So if anybody wants to join, it's just called Leaving the Witness Book Club. And we can meet oh, fantastic. So is there a link that I can put in the description as well yeah. for that? Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, so Laura. yes. Um, please buy the book and please engage in the dialogue that ensues. Uh, but again, Amber, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this discussion. I know I have. Please don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more such videos. But for now, thank you so much for watching.